Okay, well, welcome everybody um, to tonight's public input session for, for the 400 Gape, Great Pond Road property. Um, we'd just like to again thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, reiterate, we have cookies and snacks at the back of the room. We have pens and uh, pads of paper back there also if you want to write your comments down. Um, we also will have input at the, um, at the microphone tonight. Um, so we have a presentation for you tonight and a video that we'd like to share with you. Um, so first of all, let me welcome you. My name is Dick Valancourt. I'm a member of the select board. Um, we'll kind of talk through a little bit why we're here. Um, so if most of you recall, um, in May of 2022, we voted at town meeting to purchase the property at 400 Great Pond Road. Um, it's a very unique property that sits basically in the lake. It, it is in the lake. And we purchased it because we had some concerns about the, um, some dangers to the lake. Uh, there were um, issues with the, with the oil tank being in the, in the basement of the building. Um, and part of our town goals, the watershed plan, the water capacity plan, the open space plan, all of this calls for acquiring properties when, we can, when they become available around the lake so that we can really protect the watershed around the lake. Um, so that was purchased. Um, in September, we closed on that, that building. It was $1.8 million for the building and the property surrounding it. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, some of the principles that this committee has worked under is that, you know, first of all, first and foremost, the reason we purchased it was to protect the drinking water. So that's why that really is one of the, the driving principles of what we've been discussing as a committee. Um, also, in, in our plans, we have to provide for open space. Um, this is about seven and a half or 7.8 acres of land. It's open space. Um, respect the his appropriate level of historic preservation is one of the other things. You know, this building, to me, it's iconic, the way it sits in the lake, and it's visible from so many places around the lake. So it's really something that, you know, we, we need to, you know, think carefully about on how we proceed forward with, with the building. Um, possibly prevent, uh, provide recreational opportunities as feasible. Um, there's a lot of land there, 7.8 acres. Uh, some of it's covered by a conservation restriction, which Gene will talk about later. But there's opportunities there for potential recreational uses, um, multi-generational uses for that property. And then also um, fiscal responsibility. Uh, we have a, a, a responsibility to the town. Uh, we spent $1.8 million for that property, so we need to look at you know, what are the options we have with that. So what I'd like to do is introduce you to our committee. Um, so we have a committee of 11 people that have been, we've met so far, we, our first meeting was in early December. We've met twice a month since then. So we've had six meetings um, and including two site visits to the property, uh, to walk through the property and spend a great deal of time just looking through the property. So on the committee, we have our, our fire chief, John Weir, we have the Director of Public Works, Jim Stanford, back there. Uh, we have the Facilities Director, Steve Foster, to my right here. Uh, we have our Planning Director, Gene Enright. Um, we have um, a dual responsibility. Mr. Boynton, Peter Boynton, is the Planning Board and he's the Harbor Master. So, um, and then we have the Chair of the Planning Board on with us, John Simons, who I just saw him come in. Hi, John. Um, we have the Historical Commission, uh, or a designee. We have Ron Rudis, who represents the Historical Commu Commission myself representing the select board, and then we have three at-large members that we appointed, um, Ger Gerald Brecker, uh, Norma Lockman, and Willie Vincent over here. Um, so uh, th this team has really done a lot of work in this last two to two, three months um, and put a lot of time in to try to get to, to this point. And um, so one of the goals of this committee was to have an article on the town warrant this year for some disposition of this property. And we're working towards that. We may not get to that. We may get to um, a plan to get to a plan, but we're, we're working hard to try to get to something that, as the more we get into it, the, the more, you know, it's like, of course, peeling an onion, the more layers you, you start to find about the property. Um, so I think I skipped by the agenda real quick. Can you just flash back the agenda slide? So just by way of agenda, what we're planning to do tonight is to welcome, introduce you to the committee. Uh, in a minute, I'll talk about the meeting goals. And then we'll have a short video um, that Peter will uh, narrate for us about the property, which I think you'll find very interesting. Um, and then we're going to talk about what we've learned 
And then some of the alternatives that we've been discussing and, and you know, where we would like some input from, from the public, and then we'll have the public input. And again, we have, we'll have a podium over here. We'll have a roving microphone if folks don't feel they want to go to a podium. And we'll also have the ability to, to give us some messages over um, through pen and paper as well. And then we'll talk about next steps. So if you could just move forward. So for tonight, the, the goal of the meeting is, to, is really to share with you what we've learned so far. Again, we've been meeting since early December and um, talk about, you know, um, what we've discovered and, and where, um, you know, what we, how we feel about what we think the property and the mitigations that have been happening to the property so far by the town. And then we want to hear your thoughts on how we should proceed. And we want to encourage in, uh, continued communication. So you'll see, uh, it's probably hard to read on here, but we'll make sure the information gets out. But we have a, a website uh, off the town page that we can share information with. And we also have uh, an email address up there that is specific for this committee that you can share information with. I apologize, that is really hard to read. But <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure it's, it's much bigger on, on another slide. Um, so let's move forward. So what we'll do now is we'll take a few minutes and, and run through this video and uh, Peter will narrate for us. Great. Tell me one, Peter. So the purpose of the video is, uh, no, I'm gonna do it from here, Gene. It's for those of you who haven't had a chance to see the house, we're entering from Great Pond Road. To the right of the entrance driveway is a conservation restriction. You're gonna hear more about that later. You can see ahead of us the surface of the lake, and that shows that this is a significant drop from Great Pond Road. It's 66 feet, and that's actually one of the limiting factors of use of the property, because anything that's done on this property will drain into the lake and our water supply. So it's very important to take that into account. It's one of the largest single-family parcels of land on the lake. To the right is the garage. That's fairly recent. It's a poured concrete foundation. And then, of course, the house straight ahead. And you can see virtually no parking. Now, to the left is the original part of the house, which was a family boathouse. To the right is a series of one-story additions. Also, on the second floor, you can see the shed roof. That is an addition. It's not part of the original construction. And the original boathouse here you can see has had three sides surround open porch, covered but open porch and no shed roof. That entire open porch has now been enclosed and you'll see that in the tour, we'll go inside. Also of note on the foundation is a large garage door. That's why it was a family boathouse. Boats could actually paddle in and out of the basement. Here's part of the enclosed porch. Now we're going to enter into the house. This central room was really the primary space. It was almost the only space in the original part of the uh, family boathouse. You can see a stairwell going up. And to the right, we'll show you later, a fireplace. Now this used to be part of the open porch. Uh, it's kind of interesting. They've used uh, uh, porch doors to enclose it. Now this is a photo from early on in roughly the same location. You can see that deck is all open and enclosed with those patio doors, which when you open them, you uh, patio doors to nowhere. Here's an early photo that shows that central room with the staircase. We believe that's original. To the right is a small room and that was part of the open porch, similarly enclosed. Going up the staircase now, we'll take a look at the rooms upstairs, most of which are the result of adding the shed roof. We'll take a look to the right so you can see that second floor balcony area. Enter, this is the largest room. We think it was probably the master bedroom. These windows are circa 1970, 1980 Anderson style windows. And the view uh, is just absolutely stunning. That's really the huge value here. This is uh, one of four bathrooms, two on the second floor, two on the first floor, and very similar 60s, 70s, 80s uh, style fixtures in all four bathrooms. We'll go back out to the central balcony now and take a look at the last two rooms on the second floor. We'll turn left into what was probably also a small bedroom. And again, the same Anderson style windows. This is also part of the shed roof addition to the house. 
not part of the original. Go back out to the balcony. We're going to take a sharp left and go into uh, the smallest room on the second floor. This may have been part of the original uh, family boathouse. Uh, not certain of that, but a very small second floor room here. And then back to the balcony. Uh, we'll speed up going down the stairs. This is the second bathroom on the second floor, second of four total bathrooms. Back down to the central room, uh, fireplace to the right. Uh, we believe that was original. <coughs> We've already been in the room to the left. This room was also part of the open surround porch. And this room was also part of that open porch, and it's also the start of the first story addition. The open porch was where we're looking now, to the right. And the left half of this room, starting there, was part of the first floor addition. There's another bathroom. This is a galley kitchen. The kitchen is actually spread across three rooms. You'll hear more about the historic aspect of this when uh, Ron speaks. Soapstone kitchen here and a uh, stove to the right. And a third uh, room uh, associated with the kitchen here, small sink straight ahead. Uh, that door that's barred is a very small three season porch and then refrigerator there. And that is a second door down into the basement. To the right is uh, a first floor bedroom, carpeted bedroom. This is also part of the first floor addition that extends well to the right of the original family boathouse. Come back out to the hallway. Here's another example of the 60s, 70s style bathroom. I'm told this is coming back into style. <laughs> And then uh, a sort of small intermediate room here. You can see some of the typical wear on the floor. There's a couple spots on the ceiling that have been painted, may have been previous water leaks. Through a very narrow connecting door here, this is the end of the first floor additions. And I think I miscounted the bathrooms. There's actually five, I think. Three first floor, two second floor. And here's the last of the first floor bathrooms. And now we're back to the central room and going down the main entrance to the original part of the basement. You can see the age of some of the fixtures here. As we go down, you'll see the fieldstone foundation, that's original, and the poured concrete floor. That's uh, a change. This used to be open water, access through the garage door. The garage door was in the wall straight ahead there. It's since been removed and patched. We think there's about 17 of these lally columns that have been added to support the house. You can see from the water stains the typical level of the lake flooding this basement. That's a structure put in to support the fireplace we saw earlier in the central room. Here's two of the 17 lally posts dedicated to supporting that fireplace area. Typical corrosion from the frequent flooding and a lot of those concrete supports are cracked. This one's cracked on all four sides. You can see tar applied to the base of the steel lally pole to try to limit corrosion. And there's a date on this concrete foundation. We think it's either 94 or 96 when these 17 lally poles were added. This is the other half of the basement under the first floor addition. And this is where the utilities were. Dick spoke about this. This is where the flooding was putting the drinking water supply at risk because of an oil tank, paint cans, and other hazardous materials. The hazardous materials have been removed. This is how the owner was trying to prevent the flooding. This concrete barrier and then sliding in the wooden panel, and that's when uh, Jim Stanford would get calls to the DPW. Now this is a Brady Bunch style montage of uh, different types of maintenance issues, uh, the house was built in 1900, 1901, so none of this is really surprising that a house of that age has maintenance and perhaps a series of code issues as well. There's those 1970s circa Anderson windows. 
and a big concrete a bulkhead along the lake side of the house was added. So here's the original family boathouse, the one-story addition. Here's the 7.8 acre parcel. You can see it rising up to the Great Pond Road, 66 feet worth of drop from Great Pond, and there we are back at the lake. Thank you. Steve, over to you. Good evening, uh, Stephen Foster, Facilities Director. I uh, want to give you a rundown of things we've done to the building. Uh, the immediate, I'll call it stabilization measures, uh, most importantly, uh, there was a, a two corroded oil tanks in that basement. Uh, Hold the microphone you, a little bit. Just bring the microphone closer to you. Those oil tanks have since been removed, uh, new oil tank provided at an alternate location. So the immediate hazard uh, that was explained by Peter has been removed. Uh, we have done other measures here, such as stabilizing the plumbing and so forth to make sure we get through winter okay, some security lighting, uh, and put up a security gate at Gape, uh, Great Pond Road. We are going to have some ongoing expenses here on a yearly basis, much like your house uh, insurance, there's plowing, there's mowing, electricity, and so forth. Uh, these are going to be ongoing uh, general building maintenance items that will uh, occur every year. Going forward, future needs. Uh, we are going to need a roof replacement. Uh, the heating system, as dated, we're going to need some work there. The thermal envelope, uh, it's little to no insulation here, so we go through a lot of oil. The exterior cladding, it does need some repairs. That's a trim, the siding on the house. Electrical branch, branch wiring, uh, it needs some work as well. Uh, your foundation, as Peter uh, showed in the videos, uh, does need some work. Uh, there's some structural concerns here. You saw it by the uh, rusted lally columns. And uh, again, this is a field stone foundation, so water freely infiltrates this location uh, on a frequent basis. Uh, Jim Stanford has had to manage that flooding uh, on an annual basis in order to maintain a proper level at this uh, residence. Uh, going forward, if we decide to use this for some public uses, uh, we know we have to get into some ADA improvements to allow access, uh, toilet rooms, ramps, that sort of thing. Uh, there's also life safety concerns here. Uh, we need exit signs, emergency lighting, and so forth to make this compliant for a public facility. Uh, toilet rooms will be included in that, and also a, a, what I'll call it a modernized HVAC system. Jean? So you've heard the conservation restriction mentioned a couple times tonight. So the property does have a conservation restriction of the 7.8 acre parcel, 1.7 acres of which are protected by the conservation restriction. That area is identified in blue. I know it's a little difficult to see here, but this, this picture is also blown up on the wall. And if anyone has questions after, I can walk them through it. And the, the yellow area is also protected, however, it's on the abutting property. And so in total, it's about 3.03 .03 acres of protection of land, of which 1.7 acres is on this property. So the goal of the CR was to forever maintain the existing natural and open condition of the property, to protect and preserve the watershed of the lake and the town's drinking water supply. So that is actually what we're aiming to do as well with the purchase of the property and to protect and preserve existing scenic views of and from the lake shores. So from Great Pond Road is addition, in addition to from the lake towards Great Pond Road. So what's allowable in this conservation area and what's prohibited? Allowable uses would allow to introduce pervious foot trails, site pervious improvements such as bird feeders, um, small structures designed to enhance natural observation areas, the maintenance and installation of underground utilities, natural material fencing at specifically designated areas. And so they, that's described as really a split rail wooden fence along Great Pond Road and potentially along the side property line. Temporary use of structures during specific recreational activity. The example given in the CR is equestrian. I'm told they used to have horses out front here that people were riding and had events. So this is within a very, limited area and structures must be immediately removed when done. And then other traditional recreation activity is not necessarily allowable 
we'd have to consult with Greenbelt. And so even something as much as a picnic may or may not be allowable. Anything we were to propose that's not specifically listed, we would talk to Greenbelt, who actually holds the CR. So they, they hold it and they do annual inspections. Prohibited uses include the construction of any temporary or permanent structure of any kind, the introduction of any impervious surface, the deposit of any materials, natural or otherwise, the destruction of trees or vegetation, and any activity which would adversely impact the natural water and soil conditions. So again, I want to stress this is, we're speaking to that 1.7 acre area of the 7.8, and so there's certainly opportunity elsewhere, but very, very limited in this certain section. So I will turn it over to... I think we're going to go to... Um, oh. We're going to go to the next... Um, we're going to go to the historical perspective first. I changed that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Ron, you want to come up? Oh, we have a mic. It's on. Hello? Thanks. Okay, uh, Ron Rudis uh, from the Historical Commission. So, um, one of the things we're going to have to take into consideration is the historical significance, if any, of this structure. So, I'm just going to um, point out what we've found out about it to this point. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to Robin Siegel from the Historical Society, as she's done a lot of work researching this for us. Um, as, as some of this, Peter's already mentioned, it was built around 1900, and the original structure was just a boathouse, we believe. Um, as early as 1905, it appears to have been turned into a residence. Um, on the right-hand side, what you see is a snippet from a 1905 map that shows um, the structure extended a little bit from what it originally was. And it's also listed as a residence. Uh, there are other structures on the lake in this map that are listed strictly as a boathouse. So we believe around 1905 or by 1905 it was starting to be used as a, as a residence. Uh, the architect, um, Ernest Amy Machado, is a fairly well-known architect at the time. Um, very prolific, uh, though I think he died just short of his 40th birthday. He um, designed a number of city and country houses around uh, Boston and the North Shore, as well as a number of other types of buildings. Um, a couple of note is the Charles Clark House in Portland. That's on the bottom left there. It's a 14,000 square foot mansion that was built for the uh, mayor of Portland in around 1907. And the Blake Memorial Chapel on the right in Salem, um, also the Manchester Yacht Club. Uh, if you go to the MIT um, online library site, you'll find uh, a large selection of pictures um, of um, buildings that were designed by the architect, including 400 Great Pond Road. Um, the house was built for Mary and William Sutton. William was a nephew of General Eben Sutton, who was one of the founders of the Sutton Mills. Uh, and William served as a treasurer of the Sutton Mills Company. Um, as Peter had mentioned, the exterior and the foundation have been heavily modified. Uh, the front foyer um, looks very similar to what you see is in some of these earlier pictures. Uh, and the property is listed in the Mass Historical Commission Inventory of Historical Assets. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is this does not place any restrictions on how we can use what we can do with the property. Um, it's um, unlike the National Registry. Um, it's really just a recognition. There's no restrictions. So. Um Willie Besides, one of the at-large members of the uh, committee. Uh, and this slide begins to summarize some of the things we've learned about the site uh, and the property. You've heard the conservation restriction, the condition of the house, uh, and the historical perspective. Um, first, if it were to remain as a private residence, there's only one buildable lot, you can call it, on this property. No way of subdividing it because of all the restrictions on it. Uh, second, as has been said a couple of times, is very steep. Uh, if 
you don't realize it from Grape Pond Road, but you, once you start either walking or driving down that driveway, you realize it's very steep. Anything you do there is going to require uh, very careful work. Um, the existing parking is very limited. We've actually talked about trying to invite the public to go see the property, but it'll be a real burden to uh, get a lot of people in there at the same time. Um, if you're going to use the house for some public use, you'd need to add parking somewhere. Again, against the steep slope, that would be difficult to uh, construct. Um, as has been mentioned by Peter, it's, it's got exceptional views. Um, you, you're just amazed when you get into the house and you look at the lake. So finding some sort of public use that would take advantage of that would be a real positive uh, for, for that property. Uh, the water still routinely enters the basement. Uh, that's going to continue and that's going to cause further problems down the road in spite of the efforts to try to protect it. Um, it appears you could technically move that house out of the lake and up the hill, if you will, but as you can imagine, that would cost some money. Um, it'd be nice to do that, but it'll be, uh, it'd be a technical challenge and it would be uh, fairly expensive. Um, so in beginning to now think moving forward, what are some of the challenges we think we would face with using the property? Um, as Steven said, it's got a lot of fix-ups. Um, it's not uh, in proper in condition for public use right now. It would require a lot of work to use it uh, to allow the public to come in. The conservation restriction, as you heard, restricts use, very limited, in about a little less than two acres out of the seven acres of the land. Um, and with the steepness of the slope of the property, uh, there's very few spots where you could do things on the property. Um, again, as Stephen said, upgrading and maintaining a house, whether it's in the current location or moved up the hill somewhat would cost some money and would require uh, careful uh, operations to do that. Um, it, sort of in summary, um, of all the alternatives we've thrown around and all of the goals that we've talked about, um, as you can imagine, there's no perfect solution that's going to meet all of them or that would be easy to implement. With that, Richard? Excellent. So we've been throwing around in the committee five, oh, sorry, five high level, whoo, sorry about that. <laughs> that woke everybody up, didn't it? Um, five high level kind of alternatives that we've been talking. And th these are very high level, so nothing is, nothing is decided, nothing. And, and that's really why we invited everyone here tonight to hear some comments and what your thoughts are. But one of the areas that we thought would be to, uh, use as community space. Um, we've had some thoughts around youth center uses, uh, multi-generational uses. Um, as, as folks said, you know, those porches and the views are just beautiful um, spaces for just going out reading, whatever. But so some community space. Um, we've talked about taking the building down. We've talked about moving the building. All of those come with costs. All of those come with risks. Um, we talked about selling the property for a single home development. As you, as Willie had said, the property, um, the way it's laid out, you could put one house lot on that property. Um, most of the land, a good portion of the, of the upper portion of the land is, is restricted with the conservation restriction. And then coming up from the lake, we have restrictions on how far we have to be from the lake. So that makes a very narrow building envelope for if we would want to proceed with selling that for a single family home. And then the other one is potentially offer the property, the house, to another organization to move it itself with restrictions. Um, that happens often. Uh, folks don't want houses on their properties. It's happened very recently within the last couple of months in North Andover where a house was moved on Salem Street because the owner of the property no longer wanted the house and donated it to a person that was willing to move it. So that's another potential, maybe um, having um, you know, someone, another organization take responsibility for the house. So those are high level, um, and, and those are kind of seeds for thought for, for, for um, the folks here tonight. Um, as I said earlier, we have m multiple ways you can provide input to us. We'll, we'll, we welcome input tonight in person at the podium if uh, folks want to do that. 
we'd ask you, you know, given the number of people here tonight, and I'm not sure how many people would be interested in going to the podium, but just respectfully, maybe three to five minutes, um, each person up there, so we can try to get and hear everybody. Um, if you are not a person that wants to go to the podium, we have a microphone, we can bring it to your seat. Uh, or we have, as I said, we have the pens and the pads in the back of the room. If you want to write your um, suggestions down there, we'll certainly collect those and include those uh, for the record. And then we also have the email address, which we'll show uh, in next steps after public comment. But we, you, you can flash it up. Um, but we, oh wow, that's even smaller. <laughs> um, we'll make sure we get the email address out there. Um, it's fairly simple. And it's also accessible through the town website. Um, but we'd like to hear from people, um, not just the people in the room here tonight, but others. And we've already got a number of uh, input from the public um, through the email and other methods. So um, we're really happy with that. We want to compile all that. So as far as next steps, we want to compile all that input and start crafting um, how we want to present at town meeting in, um, in May. So we wanted to really leave most of the time for tonight for input. So the presentation was intended to be kind of quick and just show high level what we've learned so far and where, and where, we, where our thoughts have been. But really, we, we want to hear from, the, from you guys. Dick, so. I wonder, I know we covered this at the very beginning, but could I just summarize the five decision-making sure. principles that as a result of what we've learned so far, the committee thought that we should be guided by five principles. Uh, and in no particular order except the first one, protect the drinking water supply. Two, provide open space. Three, respect appropriate level of historic preservation. Four, provide recreational opportunities as feasible. And five, fiscal responsibility. Those were the five guidelines we kind of arrived at so far in the process. Thanks, Dick. Um, maybe I'll ask anybody else other on the committee wants to have any input at this point? Uh, anything we missed that you thought we should have covered? Uh, we all, we've all reviewed this together, obviously, but I just want to make sure um, we didn't miss anything. Okay, well, then I think we'd love to hear from anybody that wants to kick this off. Um, don't be shy. Stan, you're usually a good kickoff person. You want to get up there and, and get the ball? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Ron Rudis and uh, Jim Stanford were kind enough to host a, a walkthrough of the house a few weeks ago. Um, prior to that, I'd heard a lot about the, the property and the, and the structure, and um, I was ready to be kind of unimpressed. I, I didn't, I'd heard, you know, additions, and I didn't hear the right dates about when those additions might have taken place, so I, I, nothing about it sort of got my juices flowing until I got there. And a couple of, th I was shocked by a couple of things. First is, this is one of the most beautiful properties in North Andover I've ever been, I've ever been on. It has one of the most unusual views of Lake Kachikwik that you can ever get. Most of the views of the lake are from the other side. That's what we're used to seeing. Um, and this view is, uh, it's unbelievable. It's amazing uh, what, it, what, it, what you see from that perspective, things that I didn't even realize you could see from that side. The second thing was how impressive the structure is. Um, it, it's, it seems to me that it's in pretty good condition. Now, I, I, I know you all have been through a lot of the details, and that um, I'm sure all of those things would have to be addressed depending on what direction you know, the project took. Um, but it was a lot more impressive than I imagined it would be. And the thing I think that impressed me the most was the addition, not the main part of the structure. The addition looked almost as historic as the main structure itself. Um, the kitchen, and you saw a, a quick picture of a, of a soapstone sink. Um, behind, you didn't see on the wall, there was uh, like a, an enunciator that was used like at the, in those turn of the century houses for 
uh, servants or people who waited on the family. Uh, you know, various uh, buttons throughout the, the main house would uh, put signals on that annuncier so people could come and uh, uh, help the, the main family with whatever they needed. I was surprised that that part of the structure was more or less the same age as the main house. And you saw the map, it showed some extension to the main house as early as 1905. So it turned out that it looks like most of that structure is at least 100 years old. I had been led to believe prior to going there that the addition was uh, much later than that, but from looking at it and from looking at some of the details there, it looks all pretty contemporaneous. So it made me start to think really about the historic nature of the building and the fact that if you tried to move that building, which I'm sure somebody could figure out how to do, it would sort of lose the character of that iconic building, which represented what uh, was going on probably around that lake at that time, the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century. You know, lakes were used a lot for recreation. Uh, they were, had, people had, you know, vacation camps, cottages, all around the lakes in New England. And this is just an, this is the last example we have in our community of what that was all about. In, in some ways, it's kind of one of our iconic buildings. You know, we have, you know, the, the Schofield Mill or uh, a Parson Barnard House or the Grange that represent different parts of our historic heritage. Well, this represents another part of our historic heritage. So I know you've given us all the reasons why this is complicated and hard and it might be not able to be preserved, but you know, I would just encourage everybody to think about, I guess it's number three there, respect appropriate levels of historic preservation. You know, if we can, moving the house, I think then eliminates the historic preservation part of the, uh, the, the, the uh, what you're trying to accomplish here. Um, but maybe it's too hard to leave it where it is and try to deal with it as it is. Um, I've had some discussions with my favorite um, alternative energy person, James Warden, who has also looked at the building with us and said, oh, this would be a great thing. We could eliminate all the, you know, the fossil fuels completely and have, you know, geothermal in here, and there would be no fuel in this, on this site at all. So he's ready to propose doing that, uh, as well as, I'm sure, you know, a solar array for those buildings to make it net zero energy, which is his thing. But, you know, there are other kinds of alternatives that we can be thinking about. I'm just... I guess I'm just trying, I would encourage you all to think very strongly about the preservation of a building that represents kind of a, an iconic view of an important part of North Andover history. You know, that time when people came here from the city, Boston, to summer, and this is one of the places where they did that. So that's uh, my thoughts, and I, I provide this uh, from a personal point of view, this is not in any way uh, any sort of position of the historical society, just my personal opinion. So thank you. Sure. It was Sutton who built it originally. Yes, ma'am. Um, Stan, can you let her have the microphone? Yeah, the I'm sorry. Uh, in the old center, there was a Sutton, Sutton mansion on top of Sut the in the. I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe wrong. I'm wondering if this that. is the same person who built this boathouse. We're saying it was built by Sutton. Well, we, from what we understood is it was a, okay. it was a property you. that they went to for yeah, lake the, enjoyment, uh, uh, but not uh, living there. Robin's answer, same oh. family, different person. Oh, so. okay. Yes, Jerry. Change the configuration of the building, get away with the open 
on that shed dorm or put a bunch of very small and uncomfortable bedrooms upstairs. To what extent does that affect the value of it as a historic icon, to use your word, A, and B, are you suggesting that if this building were to be kept, that it ought to be restored to its original design so as to actually fill the role that it was meant to play as a boathouse in the summer pavilion? So answer to your first question. Um, many of the uh, historic structures we have in North Andover have been changed over time. Now, typically what we always try to do is preserve the exterior of the buildings, sort of as the historic representation. The interiors are often totally different from the way things started out. In that respect, this, the exterior of this building has been fairly significantly changed, so there's that to, to address. I was not suggesting that this would be restored to its original configuration. I don't think uh, people would have the interest or would want to spend the money that would be required to do that, and I don't think that would be necessarily a worthwhile thing to do. I do think that when you look at the, the building itself, uh, the interior and the exterior, I think it's, it represents enough of what the heritage of that period looks like to still be worth preserving as a historic structure in its current location. So that's my opinion. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah. And uh, what I'd like to say is the tour that Stan is referring to was offered to the Historical Commission and the Historical Society. It wasn't a, a public tour that was offered that we didn't offer to the entire community. It was specifically for those two organizations. Um, but thank you, Stan, for your comments and questions. Um, so anybody else? Sure, John. I uh, apologize, this might be a little rambling. I was trying to write notes as we were going along. Um, it's not often I disagree with Stan, but. Um, so when this came up for back, back, way back when, when this came up for a vote, the primary focus was this was a unique opportunity to acquire a property that was identified as a potential, for lack of a better term, problem um, as far as sustaining, uh, protecting our watershed and allowing us to raise the level of the lake because of that basement situation with the oil tank. This was a unique opportunity. We voted in favor of it to take advantage of it. You know, it, yes, it costs us money, but it, it's a lot easier than eminent domain or whatever else down the line we might have. So we, we got the property. That's great. Now we have to focus on the house. Um, as I see it, you've got a water. The house is sitting in the water. The foundation is in the water. You've seen the pictures. We have a fieldstone foundation that's been buttressed by a concrete foundation, but I don't know. You know, anytime you got constant water with a fieldstone foundation, that it's a it's a maintenance concern. Um, as I see it, leaving the building in its location, current location, is not long-term tenable for anybody, whether it's the town or somebody else purchases it. So that that being said. The house itself, as you've seen, I don't think anybody's going to question. It was absolutely stunning when first constructed, and and in the first floor additions, um, as you've seen over time, though, especially with that second floor dormer, um, there's was little to no regard to preserve to preserve the historic character and architectural character of that house. So the question is, is it worth any time or money to bring it back to the existing condition the stand related to? Furthermore, on top of that, if it was to remain a town asset and it was going to be used for a public use when it comes to adaptive reuse, now you've got to reconfigure the entire interior because it's not ADA accept accessible. You, see, you saw the little narrow doorway that can't be more than 24 inches wide. You can't get a wheelchair through there. Stuff like that. Every time you, every time you do something to that, you're, you're eliminating historic character and architectural character of the house. So the question is, is it worth it? And I don't know that answer, but I want to get that. That's, that's something we all need to consider. Is it worth our while to do what we need to do to get to this house to any sort of phase where it can be used for the town? Or is it better? Or are we better off, and I'm kind of leaning in that court, is offer the house up to someone who's willing to purchase, or not even purchase it, offer the house up 
to someone that's willing to move it, preserve it, do whatever they want with it. And if it, we don't get any offers from that, then we have to maybe make that difficult decision to eliminate the house. I hate to say it because there, you know, there, there's some architectural beauty behind it, and it's got a beautiful vista. But in its current situation, I'd, it's not long-term tenable for the town or any potential owner to leave it where it is in its current state. And John, I, I forgot to ask you for your name and address, just so for the record. John Strauss, 23 Old Farm Road. Okay. And if we could do that going forward, just please state your name and address. Um, okay. Thank you, John. Um, other? Yep. Um, Tracy Wakeman, 36 Pilgrim. Um, can you go back to your to your slide that had the um, your high level? What what can we do? Yep. And then I would ask the, the committee to speak to that as to high level I get, what has been your thought process on any of those options? Um, I'm kind of in both courts. I think the house is beautiful, but I want to take that dormer off. I want to put it back to the way it was. I want to get rid of the additions and just have that first part. And I'm looking at the money and thinking, I'd like to see that made into a boathouse for this for the town that they can actually kayak up, you know, right onto that land. Um, but I do know that that all costs a whole lot of money. So I just kind of want to know where where what were you thinking when you looked at that that list of, sure. of alternatives? Yeah, um, anybody from the board? Yeah, please. just a couple thoughts from my part. Um, uh, Dick, as our chair, has been asking us at a number of meetings, hey, we're going to have a brainstorming session as to uses, and I've always kind of bailed out to say, I'm not ready to get granularity for me on potential uses because I, at least uh, up until now and, and still now, I wanted to wait for a better understanding of the historic value. And when this committee started, we just didn't know that. Now we've learned a lot. Uh, Ron and I met with Robin, and then you know, uh, again, and uh, the historic uh, society has been very helpful. But I feel like I still don't have a full sense of the historic value, um, uh, and so I have not been willing to go down to granular ideas beyond the five general. And also, one word of caution. Um, we have had a couple suggestions about boathouse type uses. When this was built, it was built as a family boathouse, not a municipal boathouse. So those are very different uses, but obviously it's a large parcel right next to the lake. So we have talked about different you know, youth type activities that might be possible. Thanks. Uh, did you get all the answers yeah. to your questions? If but, I could just by, by the way, others uh, may have different views than me. Yeah, that was just my view. If I could just throw a couple. So yes, we've talked about community space. We've talked about multi-generational uses. Um, we've met with um, Rick Gorman, and he has a plethora of ideas what he can do there for youth and, and um, bringing, you know, setting up different programs there for youth. Um, we've talked about you know some of the passive recreation uses that we could get from there, you know, like snowshoeing or, or whatever on the property that are in alignment with the CR, but still you know allow us to, to use the property. Um, with respect to moving the building, we had a person come in, Fran Murphy, who had just moved the building on Salem Street. He actually went to the building with us and toured the building. Now he's not an expert on moving a building, but he's just done it, and he's gone through a, quite a bit of uh, due diligence when he went, when he d moved his building. So he gave us some things. He told us some things that we hadn't thought about, like the chimneys. You know, we didn't think about what it would take to move the house with the chimneys because when he moved his house, he took the chimneys down uh, because it was a significant cost to move the chimneys. We have multiple chimneys in this house, so that would be something to consider. Uh, also, you know being in the lake, it adds additional uh, challenges to lift that house up because his house, they were able to get it from both sides and pick it up um, in the way it's situated, what kind of challenges. We don't know that because when, obviously we've never moved a house, but we'd have to get someone in to talk about that. Um, you know, selling the property for a single home, we talked about that, that it's really a very narrow building envelope that could be, and does that really meet the, um, you know those five tenants that we talked about um, what and selling the property still doesn't resolve the issue with the house right we still if we sell the property we still have 
the house to deal with. Um, so those are some of the, the things that we've talked about. And, and I'm sorry, Robin, I think you had a question. I, anybody else on the committee want to jump in here? Is Chief? John, yeah, John, anybody from this side, you're going to have to either, we can get you the microphone, or you're going to have to come up to the... Uh, well, it's for the TV. It's for the TV. Uh, John Weir. Um, I think it's safe to say most of us have gone through a myriad of thoughts. We came in, a lot of us, with preconceptions of what we thought about the property. Um, after we've toured it, I think it's safe to say we've all seen some of the challenges, some of what Dick alluded to, even so much as replacing some of the paint and uh, re-roofing the property because it's on the lake. You can't just scrape a shingle and drop it on the ground. Everything has to be carried up and over. So there's been a lot of challenges. I think it's safe to assume that everybody on the committee, I think without exception, um, has flip-flopped both ways. We intentionally haven't, I think. I know personally allowed myself to get backed in the corner to any one of these tenants yet, because as Dick alluded to, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle, and we're trying to do diligence to get as much understanding of all the aspects of it before we decide, and then trying to, again, going back to those basic tenants, the first and foremost is protect the watershed. And a lot of the stuff we've already done, uh, facilities is taken care of, has immediately taken care of that problem. The oil tanks aren't there anymore. There's no longer the issue of contamination of the lake as it sits right now, which gave us the opportunity now to slow down and actually do due diligence now and think about this a little bit before we move on. And that's kind of what led us to, to today, tonight, excuse me, so we can get some input. I think we had one up here, and then we'll, we'll go to you, sir. If you could just, your name and- Yeah, and I'm Robin Siegel. I'm the curator archivist of the Historical Society. And I just wanted to say a couple notes on the um, historical part of this home, because it sounds like there's a little bit of confusion. Well, first of all, there's the thing about it being a pretty iconic place. You know, it's been there for 100 years, and everyone knows it and is familiar with it. And if you move it, it actually loses that, because its identity is a boathouse. It's still, I mean, it doesn't have the open door at the bottom, but like it's in the water. <laughs> so if you move it out of the water and it doesn't have that stunning stone foundation, like it's just a random like building. It doesn't really retain its historic value. Um, and the other thing, as far as the addition goes, it is pretty contemporaneous with the house. It seems like they built the house about 1900. Uh, they spent some time in there. They said, wow, this is so amazing. We should actually be living here and not up the hill away from the water view. So. They did the addition by 1905. This is less than five years. It's the builders of yeah. all of the additions. Yeah. Um, definitely the main part of the addition. There's one little section that pokes off the back. That might not be, but the rest of it, yes. So really and a lot Robin, of the addition. Can, Robin, can we tell when the shed roof was put on for the second floor above the original uh, structure? I don't know about that part. Um, yeah. That part, I. I mean, I it's no really idea. changed the look of the house. That does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but thanks. I don't know uh, as far as that. I mean, we could look at, I don't know if, I haven't seen them. If anyone could dig up some old aerial photos that would show it. But those early ones are really, really hard to make out. So probably not. Um, I have a question, too. Uh, the changes that you need to made. speak into the mic, oh. sir. Hey, if you they can made give me by the original that. architect? I'm not going to get it. So I don't know, I don't think we can figure that out. <laughs> I don't think there's a record of that that I know of, unless the previous owners maybe had actual plans of that. Um, the style is the same, so they kept the same style throughout. It has matching windows. It's very matchy-matchy. Um, but my point, though, is that, um, you know, as far as, like, the time period that Stan was talking about, um, and the lifestyle and capturing this part of North Andover's history, um, the addition is still a part of that. It's the same family, the way that they use it. It's just like the way that you would use your own property. Maybe it changes over five years, but it's the same family and they're living the same lifestyle. And um, it's a slight evolution, but it's, it's really doing the same thing. It's not really changing the value of the building in any way. Okay. Robin, if you could hand it to that gentleman behind you. And if you could say your name and address, please, sure. so we uh, get it on the record. Uh, I'm, I'm Edward Nieberger, 476 Grape Pond Road. I'm the next-door neighbor. Ah. Well, welcome. 
My, my property is just to the, uh, just to the, well, it's between your property and the golf course. Yep. And I've been there 32 years, and Walter Sachs has been my neighbor, and he's been a wonderful neighbor. And I've uh, enjoyed his company, and we've compared how we take care of our respective properties across our lot line. I was sorry to see him go. He's in his 80s. He has a, a port and a heart condition. So uh, he was ready to throw in the towel. My, my main question is to go back to square one and uh, to ask why you bought the property. I understand you bought the property because it was a lake level issue. You wanted to raise the level of the lake by a foot so you could add another month's worth of water supply to your new condominiums and new apartments. And I can understand that. I would like to have that clarified as to what is going to happen to the lake level. And it seems to me that is going to be very basic as to how it's going to affect the foundation of the house, the lolly columns, and the whole use of the property. Thank you. Uh, Jim, would you mind addressing those questions? I'll just uh, right here. Uh, Jim Stanford, Public Works Director. Um, I was actually at town meeting. Um, it was my department, our thought process. Uh, having worked with the previous owner, Mr. Sachs, um, it was kind of a love-hate relationship because we were always fighting. He wanted us, not in the literal sense, but he wanted us to keep the water level low um, because of his personal property. And from a municipal standpoint of managing a water company, uh, our biggest concern is, are we going to have enough water? I can tell you right now, um, the town in this whole area is just coming out of a drought, believe it or not. Um, but if you look at the lake level, it's relatively low. So from a management standpoint, um, we're concerned about, especially during the summer months, um, having enough water. It, it's not so much development. I'm less concerned about that. It's, and I think I mentioned this at town meeting. Um, it's really irrigation use why we have a problem with water during the summer. Um, but with that said, we, you know, we supply the water. We use, we have a great water source being Lake Kachikawik. Um, I am at fault. I've heard it mentioned twice now about raising the water level. And that was my initial, that's how I described it, which was a mistake. I think I clarified it pretty soon on that it's not that we want to raise the water level, it's that we don't want to fight to lower it. And, um, and so what we're trying to do is when the water level comes up, that foot, and it's generally about a foot, where it starts going over that, you saw that um, board that he, Mr. Sachs would take out. Um, it was more, if we could maintain it at that level and not have to drop, drop it, and the way we drop it is we have the hatch, which is the control section, where we actually crank open the gate and let all that nice water out, out to the river and out to the ocean. Um, <clears throat> in a year like this, where we're projecting right now, we don't have a lot of snow melt. We don't have a lot of snow, which is a good thing from maintenance standpoint, but a bad thing for the lake. What you want is snow level to melt slowly, seep into the ground, really recharge that aquifer, and keep the lake level up. And so, especially in March and April, when we get heavy rains and we get a lot of rain, we don't want to just be opening up those gates. Now, with that said, um, I think from the point of view of me, when I was advocating for the property on that one foot, and think of it as not trying to raise it, but not trying to lower it that foot. Um, we've met that objective. I'm no longer going to impact Mr. Sachs' property, um, and who was a very good steward. I, I want to say he was an excellent steward, very proud of this property. Every time I went over to talk with him, yes, we had, you know, we were, we were looking at it from different points of view, but his, it was his family that I think has owned the property continuously, his wife's family, since it was years. built. And he was very proud of the property in that respect. So the lake level was certainly my, my first uh, issue that I brought up, but really the main concern was the water quality. Uh, what we don't have here, but I did have a town meeting, is the water intake for the treatment plant is just off of this property, within 50 feet. Um, so we were always concerned 
every time I'd go down in his basement, I'd see those oil tanks. Um, and I really wanted those oil tanks out of that area because if, if they did leak, if they did rupture, it would already be in the water system just because of the location of the, of the intake to our treatment plant. Now, maybe we would catch it, but maybe we wouldn't. So that was really the environmental concern and water quality. Uh, the other thing is you saw the washing machine. He had a whole host of chemicals that any one of us would store in our basement. The difference here is it's actually in the lake. So when I advocated for purchasing this property, it was really so that we could grab control. And as you saw, we're not, from a town perspective, we're not uh, keeping chemicals. We moved the oil tanks. They were rusty. So we're very pleased over that. So my immediate concern as to the two reasons why we, I advocated for purchasing the property have already been met. So now from the committee, as you mentioned, as, as was mentioned that, you know, regardless of what we do from here forward, we've really met that initial criteria. And I think, you know, regardless of whatever we, we ultimately decide is there's probably more that we can do, whether it be more restriction or if we do sell the property or the house, um, there are things you can do put within the, the property sale to protect it further. So I hope I answered. I know it was a little long-winded. I hope I answered your question. Well, that, was a nice gen that was a very nice general answer. To re-debate purchasing the property because we purchased the property. We're really here tonight to try to understand yeah. and get thoughts on how we can move forward and what some of the best uses for the property are. So, I mean, we own the property, so that's, that, that's behind us. So now it's what do we do? You know, what, what, what are some thoughts on how we can move forward with it? Hi, uh, Jim LaFon, 329 Osgood Street, and I, I moved to North Andover in 1957 from the Lawrence General Hospital. <laughs> um, and, I've, and I've been a longtime user of the lake. I grew up fishing with my grandfather there, and my mom grew up fishing with him, uh, her father. So we spend a lot of time actually looking at the property from the lakeside, which is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a different perspective. And I, I do agree that for years and years I've been looking at it saying, boy, they really kind of maybe didn't put the right windows in. It kind of lost a little bit of its charm, et cetera. But, um, but you know, looking at it from the street perspective and, and pictures of the interior and all, it, it certainly looks like a beautiful property to me and that has a lot of potential. I, I think that one of the things, though, that the town is really going to have to iron out is this whole issue of water level. And, you know, is that, you know, I think, you know, there must be ways to model and project out, you know, what, if we do need more capacity, whether it's through development or more irrigation in the future, you know, what is that maximum water level? Um, I'm not in the water resources business, but I, I did spend a few years on the Conservation Commission, and I know that raising the water level in the lake is potentially going to cause problems with shoreline erosion, increased turbidity in the water, which would make the water more difficult to treat. So again, I think we need, to, we need to find out, you know, what is the model? What are we going to need to have for a maximum water elevation? Because if it is a six inches higher than it is today, or a foot higher, or a foot and a half, or two feet higher, I think that solves the question. We're never going to be able to maintain a home that has water levels that are even higher than today. And whether that's 10, 15, 20, or 25 years down the road, again, we should be able to model that and you know, come up with the answer as to whether it's viable to keep the home there. And um, you know, again, if our water levels are going to stay where they are today, there must be pumps, ways to you know, keep the water that flows in um, you know, at a reasonable level or even going out um, at the same level that it's coming in. I mean, there are all types of pump systems out there. So that's my comment. I think a lot of it's going to hinge on water levels in the lake as to whether we can keep the house and then, of course, the question of do we want to? And um, you know, I certainly would love to see it stay there and, and be even brought back to its original charm. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, you may be owning the mic for a little while. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Anybody else want to have um, anybody else have any uh, Rick, comments? Rick, oh. Rick, just a point of information. I wonder if Jim Stanford, could you please tell us how far the intake is for our water supply from this? 
residents. Yeah, it's about 50 feet. And I think even uh, Peter Boynton could, he's seen it before. You can actually see it if you're out there boating. It's relatively yep. shallow. Okay, the point is our intake, our drinking water is very close to a building. That's human activity. Whatever you do on the house to fix it or whatever, the intake is right there. You don't want to make a mistake <laughs> that being that close to your intake with your major water supply is the point I want to make. Point number two, if we decide going forth we want to save this building, let's think of a use. And the reason I say it is, presently we've got several vacant unused buildings. The Schofield Mill, the carriage house at the Stevens Estate, the gatehouse. This will be vacant building number four. From a facility perspective, it's an opportunity for bad things to happen to vacant properties. You've got to be careful. And I'll leave it there, just take it into consideration when you think about the options. Thank you. I, uh, Hi, uh, Joanna, uh, Colin Tanker, 660 Great Pond Road. Um, I, uh, I live near to the lake and uh, the first thing I noticed when I moved to North Andover 12 years ago was that iconic house, as Stan says, on the lake. Um, there's not many um, towns in Massachusetts, in northern and eastern Massachusetts, that still have this real iconic uh, vision that we see. Anybody that has ever uh, walked the trails or taken a canoe out, um, just like Jim said, um, it's an amazing uh, sight to see, and it presents us all with with some kind of a vision, maybe we could live here one day, it kind of gives us an aspiration. Um, I, I trust that um, the town has done the right thing in purchasing the property. Um, if I understand rightly that Jim has said that um, we have taken the measures, uh, according to Stephen uh, Foster, um, that there is no uh, further damage to the water and that the basement has been cleaned out. Um, the oil tanks have been clean, cleaned out, so we're now at the point to move forward in, in finding a resolution for this. Um, because it's such an iconic property, I think I agree with a couple of people here that have said that if you take it down, if you move it, um, you will lose it completely. You will lose that vision when you, you drive down Great Pond from Butcher Boy. Um, you, will, you will lose that, part, that element, and it's a very iconic piece of North Andover. Um, in terms of future use, um, I agree with Tracy. It would be great to have the youth services use uh, the property more. Um, I think turning it into a boat house would be an amazing idea. I also think I have experience, as Steve knows, with the Stevens Estate Garage House and the, and the Gatehouse, uh, and knowing that if you have an empty property and nobody lives there and nobody's taking care of it, then there is potential for increased damage and deterioration down the road. Um, I like to see, uh, personally, something in the way of a three-season um, destination, uh, whether the house is stripped down and turned into the equivalent of a pavilion. I never actually, I have, I've only seen the pictures, I never saw the house, but if you could strip it down, you could take the water out of it, you could take the bathrooms out of it, uh, take the heat out of it, take everything out of it and, and take it down to its basics that would survive three seasons and then create opportunities in those three seasons. You can have temporary bathrooms, you can have temporary catering, water supply, you can have temporary you know, kayak rentals there and turn it into a park. But just like Harold Parker State Park, you know, State Forest, you have a three season pavilion um, that people can use, that the youth center kids could use for activities, that people could maybe rent out at low, um, a low price just for renting out for parties during the day um, from you know, May through till uh, October or November. Um, I see, yes, there's, you know, it, it's going to be expensive to if you have to do anything in terms of ADA, if you have to make it accessible. So by taking everything out of that and just providing that space, that beautiful uh, corner of, of, of parkland that you have there, as well as um, the boathouse concept that it originally came from and the access to the lake, I think um, it's such a great opportunity that um, 
it would be great to, um, to be able to continue seeing that pro iconic property for another 100 years down the road and more. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, there's no other comments tonight? Oh, oh Rosemary, absolutely. Oh, can we get you to, oh, Rosemary, let's get you the mic and if you could introduce yourself, please. Uh, Rosemary Smedeli, 65 Green Street. So talking about the plans um, Stan talked about with James uh, Warden, does that ruin the historic value if we find alternative ways to heat the property or to make it environmentally friendly um, that we, we could adopt? Um, and also maybe make it as a model structure for people to see, look, it, we've got this older home and we've modernized it without ruining the historic structure of it, but brought it up to, um, you know, heating and cooling. I'm sorry? Talking about zero, net zero. Yes, so, but when you make those changes, does that disqualify it as being Oh, well, that's good news. Here we go. Well, didn't this work out well? I, yeah. <laughs> I would say, um, you know, as far, far as something like geothermal heat, like, no, you wouldn't see any changes. I don't know about putting solar panels on the roof, but maybe if they put up a tracker or something like that, like further back, further back yeah. yeah, or something like that. Um, there's plenty of land. <laughs> but, and I don't know which direction. I don't know. I get to around. But, yeah. Well, my thought process, too, is there might be an organization that would take this on as, as um, sort of a grant program showing a great example on how you keep the historic character of buildings, however, bring it into modern times and also save money if we're doing it the right way. Um, okay. So uh, one answer to your question, Rosemary, is that James House, which is historic on Academy Road, has uh, geothermal heat and it has its own photovoltaic array in the backyard. So it is completely net zero itself. And it's a historic building and has preserved the historic character of that building. So yes, it is possible to keep uh, a building historic, but yet bring it up to all the modern levels of HVAC or whatever it is. Um, the thought that came to mind when thinking about this was the brick store. As you all know, um, the, uh, the Historical Society or the people who founded the Historical Society um, in mid-century, last century, got concerned about uh, the historic buildings in the old center. And at that time, in the 50s, there was no, there was no historic, you know, state historic commissions that tried to preserve any of that sort of stuff. So their approach to the problem was to buy the buildings, right? They formed a, uh, an organization and bought the buildings. Well, one of the buildings that they bought, which was uh, separate from the others, was the brick store. And it has its own corporation, and it runs separately. So I'm thinking to myself, could you make this a separate nonprofit organization for this structure? and run this property separately somehow along the same lines? I, I, I haven't thought that through, but that's something that other we've done. Um, is that an option? I, I don't know. Something to think about, right? I got another phrase for you. How about this old boathouse? <laughs> See if we can get the guys to come in. Um, you have it for now, Rosemary. You got the you got the microphone. Um, anybody else uh, comments input? Okay, so let's flash up the next steps slide. So um, again, the next steps that we um, we've all been taking some notes tonight. Um, so is to compile the input. Uh, we encourage you uh, if you have other input that you didn't want to share tonight or that you think about on your way home. 
please reach out to us. Um, if you go to the North Andover website, North and um, northandover.gov, um, there's a link out there for the Great Pond Road Committee. On there is the um, the email address that's published. Um, if it is up there, let me just read it off to you. It's 400 GPR, so 400 GPR at northandoverma.gov. Um, that email will come to us if you have other comments or other thoughts um, that you might have uh, from now until town meeting. Please send them to us. And, um, you know, we'll start working on presenting um, to the, the select board our thoughts on what we should be looking for um, from town meeting. If it's nothing, it's nothing at this point. But we, we have this committee was formed to put together an article for town meeting. And again, it might be an article that says we need to do further study and we need to um, maybe have some architecture, can maybe answer some of those questions that were raised tonight about the structure and, and, the, and the foundation. Um, we don't have, this committee didn't have a budget to go out and hire any consultants to do that. So we had to really rely on, um, you know, expertise around, around us and, and, you know, historical records. Um, so, you know, that might be the ask, is maybe we can get some additional funding to figure out what all of those ADA improvements that Stephen talked about, um, the life safety improvements that he talked about, what would all that cost? And then, you know, then we, we start making some other decisions about the, the property. Um, so, anyway, we'd love to hear from you, and I know it's, everyone's not uh, a fan of public speaking, so please don't be shy to send us emails. We do collect it all, and, and um, we have, uh, folders and we, we'll publish it all as well um, anonymously if you'd like and um, and then the next step would be to present at town meeting um, what our um, our intent is with the article so any other questions or comments before we close out tonight yes sir Mr. Newberger. Uh, we need the microphone again uh, told me I was going to put duct tape across my mouth tonight. <laughs> but, you know, over, over, the 30, over the 32 years, Walter has had a very good relationship with the people that control the water level. I think was, his name was Mershon. Does that ring a bell? Uh, Mershak. That's it. Um, and, and the lake level stayed pretty steady. And it did not undercut my trees, nor his, nor yours, uh, for most of that time. Until the last half a dozen years, we've had a lot of undercutting from the ice, you know, the lake level coming up, the ice going under the roots, cutting them, killing the trees. The trees fall over, what? You can't clean them up. Um, but regarding the, uh, the water, they used to fish off the back porch, by the way, and they used to catch, catch perch through the, through the sliding glass doors. Uh -huh. And in the last few years, when after Mershak had, had retired and gone away, the lake level has been rising more and more and, and flooding my lower level, my, my lower area, more and more. And I'm sure Walter's basement more and more. He kept it quiet with me until last week because he didn't want to spoil the sale. He was, he was asking substantially more money than you paid. I won't go into that right now, that's a, that, that's a negative story. But I want to give you a positive story in that um, in the last few years he's have found clams, freshwater clams in his basement. <laughs> and I, 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 I mentioned that to um, a natural historian friend of mine at a museum and he said, well that means he's had fish in the basement. And I said, oh that's right. Because these freshwater clams, of which there are four species in our lake, which is very, a very healthy lake, by the way, to have four different species of freshwater clams, you have to have four different species of fish because the, the little clams shoot the glochidia up when they see a shadow pass over them. And those little glochidia get caught on the fish's gills. The fish swims upstream or into Walter's basement. The glochidia fall off the gills and they start to get bigger. So he's had, fish in his, he's had fish in his basement, too. But if you want to keep this house in the same place, you're going to have a whale of a problem. <laughs> I love the house, too. And I love the property. I walked it today. I don't usually trespass, but I did. 
I walked over to that, to that available space where a, a house could be built. It is a very nice location. If the, house, if the current house were removed, it would be even a better view of the lake from that location. I know that's not what you want to hear if you want to save that house. I would like you to save the house too. But there should be an alternative. The whole purpose of you buying the property was that, that the house is a problem for the lake, and the lake is a problem for the house. The house was there long before the lake, by the way. The lake was a lot smaller when that house was built. And the, ho the house, yeah, that's right, it was dammed up, and the lake level came up to the house. So he's been trying to fortress that house from the water all this time. I think that's everything for tonight. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Rebecca Abbott, 50 Blueberry Hill Lane. I, I don't know if it's possible to save the beautiful Fieldstone Foundation. And similar to what you were saying, where you almost have a pavilion type of thing on top where you can still enjoy the view, but you're, the rest of the house, unfortunately, you get rid of just because it's a lot to maintain and would be extremely expensive for the town. And we don't have a great track record of caring for these historic structures. We have a lot of them that are sitting empty. So by preserving maybe that foundation and, and making it a place where you can view the lake and then trails and youth center activities and maybe kayak rentals or something in that, you're, you're, you're preserving what needs to be preserved, which is the view yeah, we, and the we foundation. Did, we, we did talk about that, preserving the foundation, and that seems to also present other challenges as well because the foundation uh, being part of the house has some warmth to it and there's some heating in there that keeps in it, it from freezing and some of the thought was that without the house the foundation fills with water and the water expands and contracts as it freezes and and and, and melts and that does damage to the foundation as well that's the opinion of many people on the on the committee of course again we're not all experts in that so it would need to be studied further but that it has been discussed also been discussed, can we fill the basement with cement and um, you know, keep, you know, just have a, 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 a total cement basement if we remove all of the fixtures from the basement. Um, some of that's been discussed. We've talked about a lot of things and we really, you know, we appreciate everyone tonight providing some input that help us you know, guide future decisions and directions. Just, just some kind of viewing platform because you, know, you want to preserve the view um, yeah. and maybe yeah, I think not that the house. Someone mentioned it earlier about like a pavilion, I think, um, yeah. Right here, yeah. So yeah, good, yeah, good, good input. Yes, John. Oh, and someone else. Sorry, sorry to prolong this anymore. So you guys had a question of what's the next move? And I, hearing the discussion we've had tonight is perhaps um, as far as a warrant article is concerned is um, soliciting funding to do a historical assessment of the property, you know, from, from you know, an expert to go in and say, yeah, to bring it up to this speed, it's gonna cost you this much, you know, and you can do it. And I hate to say it about a historic asset in town, because I, I think we all, in an ideal world, would love to preserve it, but actually do like a cost-benefit analysis of how much is it going to you know, cost the town to bring it up to speed to do something with it of a public, to serve as a public benefit? Because again, you have a relatively small building. What can you do with it from a public standpoint? What, of what use is it to the town's people? But what can you do with it? That's what I'm saying is we need to establish, we should have but you have, to, you have to figure out what you have for an asset. You have to know what's it gonna cost you to fix it up before you can even think about the next step. So maybe that's, that's the next move is to allocate funding to do that study. Yep, and that's, we've, we've discussed that. And uh, so, certainly. D did you wanna make a comment? No, okay, thanks. Oh, I'm just holding the microphone. No, I was talking to the gentleman in the back room. Yeah, back room. No, he doesn't, he doesn't, he just was. <clears throat> okay, um, anything else? Well, again, thank you all for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, 
and you know we appreciate the input and please um, provide more if you have it if you think of something please let us know and this has been going out live on um, North Andover Cam so hopefully other folks at home will be considering sending us some input as well I'm sure we'll get a lot now we'll get we'll get some anyway given the discussion that was taking place tonight so we really appreciate the open discussion and the candidness of everybody so thank you all for coming out there are still cookies and water in the back there <laughs> oh I'm sorry chief we has a, a just like to say hope it makes a big difference I just wanted to publicly thank um, North Andover Cam. They came out and did the filming on this. Um, there's a bit of time involved in this, and many of the members here have been donating their time as well. But just that little film clip took uh, quite a bit of effort. And, uh, and coming out tonight, I just want to publicly thank them. Well, thanks, Chief. <laughs> OK, well, meeting adjourned. <laughs> Take cookies on your way out. <laughs>